the bottom. There we go. <laughs> now we're recording. Yeah, yeah. So we're recording. So here's the cerebrum, all right? That is one region of the brain. Another one is going to be, we'll, we'll label all these soon, the diencephalon. The third is the brain stem. And the fourth is the cerebellum, okay? So our cerebrum has two halves to it. Okay, so again, this is anatomical, so we're standing behind the brain. This is the posterior view of the brain. Okay, so our left, and also what's indicated here on the screen, is the left cerebral hemisphere. You need to be specific about that, okay? Left cerebral hemisphere. And then on the other side, we'll have our, you guessed it, the right cerebral hemisphere. So our cerebrum is made up, and I don't want you to confuse this, okay? Because when I say there's four uh, uh, regions or parts to the brain, keep that in mind, all right? That's the cerebrum, cerebellum, the brainstem, and the diencephalon. Now, the cerebrum has five lobes, okay? The first lobe, and the, the lobes are named after the cranial bone. Okay, so if you know where the cranial bones are on the skull, which I hope you do, all right, then you'll know all the lobes. Well, you'll know four out of the five lobes, okay? So obviously, this here is indicating the frontal lobe. So this lobe sits right underneath your frontal bone. Okay, it's the most anterior portion of your brain. Okay, so if you remember then, all right, the next, uh, the bone that sat on the side of your head, right underneath your ear, that was the temporal lobe. Okay? So the temporal lobe is this guy. Okay? That's the temporal lobe. Right? Right above it, but behind the frontal lobe, is the parietal lobe. That's pretty much this guy back here. That's the parietal lobe. So that's easy so far, right? You guys know the, the, the bones of the skull. All right, and then finally, our occipital lobe. It's on the back. So those four lobes, those, ooh, that was scary. Those four lobes, <laughs> you, can, you, you, can, you can see, all right, if you're holding a brain. Now, the fifth lobe, you can't see easily. So if you look here, all right, there's a little kind of uh, um, space here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pry that space open. You don't have this, unfortunately, in your uh, lab atlas. This is not in your lab atlas for you folks at home. That is the insula. It is a lobe that is deep to the temporal and the parietal and frontal lobe. Okay? That's the only one that you cannot see. And I've seen that asked on a test before, too. It's not... It's the only lobe that's not clearly visible from the outside of the brain. Okay? It's hidden underneath. Okay. So going back to the cerebral hemispheres, you had a right cerebral hemisphere and a left cerebral hemisphere. If you had a space, all right, or a gap in between, all right, and that's called the longitudinal fissure. The longitudinal fissure is the space between the right and left cerebral hemisphere. Okay, and there's actually some connective tissue that sits in between that, okay, and that is referred to as the Falk's cerebri. Yep, we'll get into that when we talk about the different, uh, uh, when we talk about um, uh, the meninges and what we call the dural septa, okay, and actually the outer layer of the meninges, which is a connective tissue that surrounds your brain and spinal cord, okay? Um, the outer layer will form these partitions that separate certain parts of your brain from other parts of your brain. Okay, so in this case, the Falk cerebri will separate your left and right uh, cerebral hemisphere, and that Falk cerebri sits in the space. That space is called the longitudinal fissure. A fissure is a deep groove in the brain. A sulcus 
is a shallow groove. Or see all these little kind of indentations all throughout the brain? Okay. These are called sulci, all right, plural, or sulcus. We're talking about one in particular. But the fissure is the deep one, okay? This is called the transverse fissure over here. That's a deep, all right, we'll, I'll label that in a second. So these little indentations here, those are all the sulcus. There's another sulcus, right? Okay, so the next one there is the transverse fissure. Transverse fissure is going to separate the cerebrum right, from the cerebellum. The cerebellum is this guy back here, a little brain. So again, we have connective tissue that spits into that space, right? And so we call that the tentorium cerebellum. I always remembered it. I thought of it like a tent flap, okay? So a tent right, that covers the cerebellum. So tentorium cerebelli is the name of that connective tissue. And the space that it sits in is called the transverse fissure. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the side of the brain here. All right, and you can see that, remember that space, uh, that little uh, uh, indentation I was telling you about between the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe, that's referred to as the lateral, lateral sulcus, but it's also known as the lateral fissure, So, which is, uh, it's, it amazes me because, like I said, a fissure is a deep groove, a sulcus is a shallow one. So either one's fine. Okay, you pick. Lateral sulcus or fissure. Right, I'm going to show you that same one here on this this is the lateral sulcus right here. There's no line over with you. All right. So now what you're seeing is this. I'm going to go back up here. See this kind of groove here? Okay. That's what we're going to label next. That's called the central sulcus. That's what that black yellow line is representing. Now the central sulcus is a very important anatomical landmark. Okay. Right now, you need to know that it separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So everything in front of the central sulcus is the frontal lobe. Everything behind it down to here, all right, that's the parietal lobe. It's an anatomical landmark that's going to uh, allow us to uh, separate those two lobes. Okay. So now we have, remember, um, I, I didn't even tell you this. See these folds here, all these little folds? Okay, these folds in the brain are called a gyrus. A singular fold is a gyrus, plural is gyri. Okay, so the fold that's in front of the central sulcus, okay, we call that the precentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus is in the frontal lobe. Remember, I said everything in front of, right? The central sulcus is the frontal lobe. So the precentral gyrus is in the frontal lobe. And we'll talk about its role. It is also, it, physiologically, it is your primary right, motor cortex. So when I, what you guys, what all you guys are doing right now, as you're writing something down, you're initiating that, 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 Command right there where that arrow's pointing, not exactly where that arrow's pointing, but in that gyrus. Okay, so that gyrus is all this right here. Okay, everything that I'm kind of shading in. When you start, like as I'm moving my mouse around, all right, signals are leaving this spot and traveling down to my hand. Okay, we're gonna learn like what what all uh, occurs for that to happen. Okay. That's the precentral gyrus, okay? So behind the central sulcus is the postcentral gyrus, okay? That's in the parietal lobe. And that's a special uh, structure because physiologically or functionally, 
that is what we refer to as your primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, so sensations, like if I'm feeling something, you know, touch my elbow, that signal is going to wind up in that area of my brain. Okay, the fact that I can feel the shirt on my body, that signal is winding up somewhere in that, in that gyrus there. Okay. So that sits right behind the central sulcus. So that's this guy right over here, everything I'm shading in. Okay, that's the post-central gyrus. We'll talk about all this more in detail. Okay, so that's it for the cerebrum. Now we're going to go to the second region of your brain, and that is the cerebellum. Okay, that's the little brain right back here. Okay, so similar to your cerebrum, there is a right and left hemisphere, okay, where your cerebellum has its own right and left hemisphere. But there's a structure that sits in between the two hemispheres, this little area right here, okay, where that area, arrow is pointing to, that's called the vermis. Right, and then on either side of the vermis, we have our cerebellar hemispheres. And here's our right cerebellar hemisphere, and this is a posterior view, so we're looking at the back of the brain. If you can see the cerebellum, you're looking at the back of the brain. Okay? I should rephrase that. If you're looking at, you can see both hemispheres of the cerebellum, you're looking at the back of the brain. Okay? So that's the right cerebral hem cerebellar hemisphere. Here's the left cerebellar hemisphere. Okay, so this next view is what we call a mid-sagittal view. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a knife and cut the brain, all right, in half, equal halves, right down the middle there. Okay, and now we're going to look at it from the inside. So uh, you don't have that, but you do have that. Okay, so where that arrow is pointing to, that's white tissue there, okay? That is called the arbor vitae. We're actually looking in the middle of the vermis here. Okay, so that white matter is called the arbor vitae. Does anyone know what arbor vitae means? Arbor means tree, vitae means life. Your life. Okay, that's it for the cerebellum. Not bad. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the third region of our brain, the diencephalon. Now there's three parts to the diencephalon. Okay, we're going to go and label each part individually. So this slide is showing you all three parts. For right now, right, you want to know that the diencephalon is made up of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and then the epithalamus. The epithalamus has two parts to it, but what we're going to do for lab, right, it has the habenuli nucleus, we'll learn about that in lecture, but the pineal gland. Every time I teach this, it reminds me of this movie. Uh, does anyone here like cult movies? No? no? There's a movie called From Beyond. Has anyone ever seen that? It's a horror movie from the... 60s or 70s. Anyways, it's based on a story by H.P. Lovecraft, one of my favorite horror short story writers. And um, in the movie, this guy invents this machine that allows him to see. The theory is that there's things in this room and in, 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 in our uh, uh, plane of existence and reality that we can't see. They're all around us. Well, he invents this machine that allows him to see these things, and these monsters. And as long as you can't see them, they won't bother you. But apparently, when he turns his machine on, they can see him, and they'll attack and do all this other stuff. Well, anyways, apparently, if he keeps using this machine, it affects his pineal gland, right, which is back here. And in the movie, he had the ability to... <laughs> move his pineal gland out of his brain and outside of his head. And it's stuck outside his head. And I can't remember, it's so long ago. I'll never forget, there's this one scene and I can't, I think this 
girl was trying to get away from him. This guy was trying to attack her, and she bit it off. But anyway, I thought that was funny. But I always think about that. Right. So anyways, the thalamus is this football-shaped structure here that I'm circling. Right there in the middle. Okay? And the only thing I'm going to say about the thalamus right now is that is your brain's relay station. When all this information is going up from your body, right, if it makes it to the thalamus, it's, it, it's only got one other place to go. It'll either go to this lobe here or this place here or here or here. But that's the relay station. It sends out, all right? Like, remember I was telling you about pain, nociception? Okay? If your pain doesn't make it past this point, you won't feel it. You won't know that you're in pain, okay? It has to make it to the thalamus, right, for you to realize that you're in pain. It's, we'll get into that concept later on, all right? But just think of right now the thalamus as a relay station. Here's the thalamus on the other model. All right, now you got, you got another picture there. Okay, this next structure is crucial that you know this. Almost guarantee you it'll be asked on the test. Okay, this is called the hypothalamus. This is this region of the brain right here. Right in there. We call it the hypothalamus. Hypo is below. It's below the thalamus. Hypothalamus, and we go over it in, in, la, in, la, in lecture, well, and in lab, I think, too. Um, there is four pages of functions for this structure. Okay? It's involved in hunger. It's involved in sex drive. It's involved in um, uh, temperature regulation, fevers. It's involved in so many stuff. We'll talk about it. There's a lot going on. And it pretty much controls all of your hormones in your body. Synthesizing, releasing, it's involved in all that stuff. So when you get to chapter 17, you'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. All right, that'll be in 211. All right, but it has a long list of things that it's responsible for. Here it is on the other um, uh, model here. Okay, there's the thalamus. Doesn't this kind of look like a duck to you? Like a duck's head right here? Here's the beak. Here's the eye. Someone told me that once. Doesn't it kind of look like that? Yeah. See? Now you know. Now it's there. You can't unsee it. It's in your brains. All right. Um, oh, and the third part of the diencephalon is the pineal gland. That's this pink kind of uh, swelling back here. Right back here. Pineal gland is responsible for the production of melatonin. Go ahead. What melatonin is? Yes, and it puts your kids to sleep. I use it all the time on my kids. I drug them all the time. I give them that and Benadryl. No, I'm just kidding. No, but here's a serious note, though. There was, uh, did you hear about uh, <laughs> this lady was operating a daycare, I think it was in Baltimore, or Maryland. It was in Maryland, I believe. This is years ago. Did you hear about this? It was a home daycare, and uh, so she was only taking care of a small number of kids. <laughs> but she, uh, parents would drop the kids off, and then, you know, do their thing, and then come at the end of the day and pick them up. And they noticed that the kids had all this incredible amount of energy. And they're like, that's just so weird, you know. They wouldn't go to bed until, like, 11 o'clock, midnight, and they're like, that's just not normal. They found out that this lady was giving these kids, she called it the cocktail, she was giving them melatonin and Benadryl. As soon as the parents dropped them off, she let them play for a little bit, drugged them, they would sleep the entire day until the parents came and picked them up. That's messed up. Yeah. Well, anyways, that's mel mel melatonin, right, is produced in your pineal gland. It's released, and that, that uh, monitors what we call circadian rhythms, right, your, your sleep-wake cycle. But also, people will take melatonin to help fall asleep, um, which is, well, I could go into a whole story on that. It does, yeah, yeah. It's like with Ritalin, too. Yeah. In fact, my, my, um, I got a nephew that he used to be on Ritalin, and it was it always it blew my mind. And I'm not anti-drug in the least bit, but my sister used to give him Ritalin in the day, melatonin at night. You know, and I'm like, you are messing that boy up. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So there's the pineal gland there on that model. All right. So one of the things that you see, all right, right below the hypothalamus is this structure right there, and that's referred to as the optic chiasm. 
Okay. So you know how uh, you have, well, you don't know this yet because we haven't talked about it, but each eyeball has its own nerve. And the nerve is called the optic nerve. So those nerves, all right, will come back from each eye and they'll actually kind of join each other for a brief moment and they'll crisscross. So here's one eyeball, here's another eyeball, all right, here's one optic nerve, here's another optic nerve. They kind of come together, they converge on this small structure, and then it has these two little other nerves that come up. Where they kind of cross over and converge, that's called the optic chiasm. So you're seeing it from the transverse view. Okay, this is a superior view looking down. All right. So anyways, right below the optic chiasm is a very important structure, and that's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is an endocrine gland. It's going to release all sorts of important hormones that help to govern many, many, many functions in your body. That's the pituitary gland. Well, there's a link between the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus because they're both part of the endocrine system. Okay, and this link, right, is this kind of to me it looks like a candy cane uh, structure because it looks on this model it just happens to look striped. This little guy right there. That's called the infundibulum. The infundibulum attaches the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. You get to learn about some of the cool aspects of that structure in chapter 17. So in your brain, you have um, these fibers, these nerve fibers that uh, will connect one side of your brain to the other side of the brain, or the front part of your brain to the back side of your brain, all right? Well, the, the fibers that connect left and right sides of your brain, those are called commissural fibers, okay? And the largest grouping of commissural fibers are called the corpus callosum. Right. This structure here right, can, allows your right side and your left side of the cerebral hemispheres to talk to each other. Okay? So they are what's called the commissural fibers. So here it is on this model. Here it is on this other model. I briefly talked to you guys about cerebral spinal fluid before, I think, right? When we were talking about the nervous tissue and all that. Well, in your brain, okay, we have this structure here called the choroid plexus. It's that blue thing there you see. The choroid plexus, all right, is the, um, the structure that helps to uh, make cerebral spinal fluid. And we'll talk about the functions of cerebral spinal fluid, right? But it helps to protect the brain, nourish the brain, does a lot of cool stuff, right? So there's spaces inside your brain, okay? And we give those spaces a name called ventricles, right? And there's two major ventricles that sit, all right, up in the cerebrum, right? They're called the left and right lateral ventricles. Well, there's this, uh, uh, some tissue in between the left and right uh, lateral ventricles, that's called the septum pellucidum. Okay, the septum pellucidum divides the left lateral ventricle from the right lateral ventricle. Again, those are spaces, and in those ventricles, that's where your cerebral spinal fluid flows. Okay, it also flows on the outside of the brain, but at the same time, it flows within the brain. Okay, So the septum pellucidum just separates those two lateral ventricles from one another. Here you can see it on this other model too. Okay? All right, another structure that we're going to see is this white line structure that's called the fornix. The fornix is part, and again, we'll talk about this in lecture, part of your limbic system. Is anyone familiar with what the limbic system is? Anyone ever seen the movie Friday? Yeah. Emotions. Messing with my money is like messing with my emotions, Smokey. All right, so the limbic system is what governs your, your, your emotions. Fear, okay, um, happiness, joy, that kind of thing, okay? So that's part of it. We'll get into some more of that discussion. Here's the fornix on this model, too, okay? <clears throat> okay, so 
There's only one more region of the brain that we haven't talked about. That's the brain stem. Okay? The brain stem is the part where your brain starts to really taper down and then eventually it will transition to the spinal cord. Okay, so there's three parts to your brain stem. The top part, right? Here's one part. Okay, so here's one, here's two, here's three. Okay, so there's three parts to your brain stem. The first part is the midbrain. That's pretty much right here. Right, and that does include this part back here, too. So I want you to think of your midbrain right, as one block here. And then what we did was we just stuck a tube in the middle of it, and it's dividing. So that's what we're seeing here. Right, this is the kind of the front portion of the midbrain, and this back here is like the back portion of the midbrain. You got this tube that's running right through it. We'll talk about what that is later on. Okay, so that's the midbrain. And on the back of the midbrain, now this is tough, so I'm gonna I gotta show you some of my horrible drawings. Remember how I showed you the midbrain, right? It's got this tube running down it. Okay, and the back part of the midbrain, okay, you got this structure back here. So what this arrow is pointing to is this top bump there. Okay, I know you can't really see it, but there's supposed to be a bump here. It's supposed to come in and then go back out. Right? Long name. Okay, it's called the superior colliculi of the corpora quadremina. Now we're looking at it from the side. If I were to spin it and look at it from the back, it would look like this. You would see this square-like structure with four bumps on it. Two up top, two down below. And so the, the arrow is actually pointing to the two top bumps. Okay. Superior colliculi of the corpora quadrimina. It has to do with visual reflexes. You ever watch a tennis match or a volleyball match when they're volleying the ball and it's going back and forth? When you're, if you're not moving your head and your eyes just keep going from one side to the next, that area of the midbrain is governing that reflex. So you, your eyes are moving in concert back and forth, back and forth. It helps with tracking. Okay. Let me make that all disappear so you can kind of see it. Again, it's not the best here on this model, right? but there are two bumps up here. There's two bumps down here, but you know, the one that's closest to us is covering up the second one. All right, so then the arrow just moved down to the bottom two bumps. So again, that's those two bottom bumps down here that we're looking at. Okay, so that's known as the inferior colliculi of the corpora quadrimina. Right? Uh, also, well, I won't tell you the other name for it, but those two bumps have to do with auditory reflexes. So if I'm sitting here or I'm in the cafeteria and you walk up behind me and you're like, hey, Dr. Kyle, and I hear you and I hear you on this side, I turn the same side, right? You're actually utilizing that auditory reflex through that region there. Right? All right. There's the midbrain on this model. All right, and the, the rest is easy. Am I missing? No, I'm not. Okay, phew. <laughs> All right. So the next part of the mid uh, of the brain stem is the middle part right here. And that is known as the pons. Okay, the pons means bridge. And it's not just this bump here, it's all of this back here too. It's all this that I'm kind of shading in. That's the pond. Then the final part, which is a cool, it, it amazes me that this part of the brainstem does what it, what, as much as it does because there's so much going on in this area. So when we go over it and lecture, it'll blow your mind, all the stuff that occurs there, like your cardiac respiration center is all there, vasomotor center. That's called the medulla oblongata. Something wrong with his medulla oblongata. <laughs> I'll show you, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Ball. All right, so that's the medulla oblongata on this one. Here it is on that one. So that's the last part of the brain before we get to the spinal cord. And the spinal cord's down here. Okay. 
that's for another class, for another time. So that's it. Any questions from anybody? No? Okay. Well, if there's no questions, please do.